Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Cincinnati Opera's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Speaker Series. Thank you to our panel, and thank you to everyone at home for joining us this evening. My name is Janice Liebenbach, and I will be your moderator for tonight's program. We have a great program for you tonight. Our topic is diversity in opera, and our panelists, two opera administrators and an opera performer will address diversity challenges and offer opportunities to break down barriers in the industry. Now, before we get started and before I introduce our esteemed panel, I wanted to offer why we are here. Tonight's conversation is possible because Cincinnati Opera Center Stage Board Associates, or CSBA for short, um, I'm a member of CSBA, and our mission is to introduce opera to other young professionals in our region in a fun and creative way. Now, last summer, we witnessed the unconscionable killings of George Floyd and other Black Americans by law enforcement. We also witnessed renewed focus of the Black Lives Matter movement. These events sparked conversations between CSBA and opera leadership and the conversations had inspired us to create open and honest discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we wanted to invite you at home to join the conversation. Now, I am not an expert on the subject, but like many of you, I have my own experience, which, I, which guides my contributions to an advocacy for the cause. I am a person of color who grew up in South Africa during apartheid. I experienced um, my country's first democratic election in 94, and I left South Africa shortly after President Mandela's term ended in 99 in pursuit of access to higher education. Today, I call Cincinnati home. I'm employed by ArtsWave, funder and service provider to arts organizations in our region. I serve the organization in two capacities, Director of Corporate Giving, in which I lead the organization's business development efforts and director of equitable arts advancement in which I steward grant making to advance black, indigenous and people of color art and artists. I also manage our art series Flow, an African-American art experience soon to be resumed. And I cultivate the affinity group Af uh, Circle of African-American Leaders for the Arts. At Artsways, we are committed to accelerate and expand programs and investments that will support the elimination of systemic racism and bridge cultural divides. Now, as I mentioned tonight, we are exploring the topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion as it pertains to the opera industry. To discuss further and to learn what is, you know, much more can be done, we have invited experts experts in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as representation from a performer's perspective. And let me introduce our panelists this evening. Our first panelist is Victoria Okafor, a native of Hyattsville, Maryland. Victoria is a recent graduate of the University of Cincinnati College Con Con CCM <laughs> and a performer of Cincinnati Opera. I'm sorry, that word just twisted me up. You're um, fine. Her, <laughs> thank you. Her main stage appearances with the company include Barbarina in The Marriage of Figaro and Delisha in the world premiere of Blind Injustice. She has also been part of Cincinnati Opera and CCM's Joint Opera Fusion New Works Workshop, as well as Cincinnati Opera community programs, which include Share the Love Truck Tour. Victoria performed in the Cincinnati Opera Centennial Documentary, Cincinnati, Op Cincinnati Opera at 100, singing A Quality Love, and from Margaret Garner, and is currently featured in the digital streaming opera from a sister's point of view. Welcome, Victoria. So glad to have you tonight. Our second panelist is Charles Chip McNeil, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Community for the San Francisco Opera. Chip is an award-winning arts educator and dance specialist with a background in musical theater, television, and film. 
He is a certified integration learning specialist and expertise in social emotional learning, cultural competency, and culturally and linguistically responsive pedagogy. His expertise is at the intersection of arts, education, and social justice. And he is currently a PhD candidate in transformative studies in education with an emphasis on emancipatory pedagogy lectures worldwide on organizational change, human consciousness, and healing informed teaching practices. That is a long bio trip, but welcome to you. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of words. A lot yes. Of words. Yes. Lots to lots to uh, to tell the audience about you. Yeah. Now, I want to introduce our third and final panelist, Kodisha Johnson. Kodisha uh, or Quo. May I call you Quo? Pronouns she, her continues to forge a dynamic and exciting career in arts and culture, gaining local and national recognition for her unique approach to fostering shared belonging as a speaker, space facilitator, collaborator, equity specialist, and creative. Her current roles include education and company culture manager of the Dallas Opera, founder and space moderator of Black Administrators of Opera, steering committee member of Opera America's Racial Justice Opera Network, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Committee Chair of Bishop Arts Theater Center, Racial Healing Committee Member of Dallas Truth Racial Healing and Transformation, and Creator, Co-Host, and Content Curator for Taking the Stage with Christian and Quo. Welcome, Quo. I hope you and your family are doing okay during this time in Texas. We are. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Now. To our audience at home, please, please, please participate in the discussion this evening. Feel free to react or comment or ask questions in the chat section. And if you are viewing from Facebook, please make use of the comment section. Well, we'll allow some time later in the program to give you an opportunity to ask any questions you may have for our panelists. Now, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Let's get started. So my first question is directed to Chip and Quo. And Chip and Quo, when you do respond, please feel free to provide some personal background. Um, my first question is, what is racial meaning? What does racial healing mean to you? Quo, do you want to go first? Oh, sure. Um, so a bit of context, my work in equity and belonging spaces center connection. They center senses and ownership of belonging, as well as racial healing, along with racial equity and racial justice. And that is my specialty in the equity work uh, before applying a broader sense of equity. Racial healing is the truth telling that is necessary for us to dismantle systems that dehumanize us that divide us, systems that allow us to believe things that are not true. Racial healing requires that we connect on a human level by first acknowledging that we are not connecting on a human level to begin with. So there are many steps that come with racial healing, but it is the work that is necessary in order for us to truly want to apply any type of equity, any type of means of achieving diversity in a space in which people feel they belong and any type of true inclusion. Otherwise, we're just using people. So for me, racial healing is definitely necessary in how we provide spaces and how we experience spaces where our individuality can be honored as well as our communities and the ways that we engage with others. I pass Thank you. Chip, hmm. Chip your you. turn. Thank you. This is a brilliant question. I, I'm so appreciate, appreciative that we open with this idea of what is racial healing? Um, this question comes up a lot in the circles with black and brown people that I'm in. And um, I think in order to address this question, however, we first have to acknowledge that we're traumatized. We first have to acknowledge that we're 
that we're that this has been an oppressive and uh, uh, a sad, a depressing experience. We are all traumatized. We're all walking around. We are the working wounded, because the oppression and the trauma are everywhere. They're in health, in 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 our in our sleep, in our diet, in every aspect of our lives. And you said make it personal. I put on COVID 25. 25. Yeah. You can't see it. You're only looking at me from the chest up, but I put on the COVID-25 because I'm not leaving my house. So, mm. but, but what we need to understand in order to get to healing, we have to understand that people of color and specifically black people are disproportionately impacted by everything we're all experiencing. And I don't mean just COVID. I mean, we know there's health inequality there and health disparities there. But when it comes to uh, uh, racism, when it comes to microaggressions, when it comes to living in these spaces in which we are still not able to fully be seen and heard and included, this is killing black people. This is killing black people. We need to yes. understand this. This is why the city of San Francisco, the state of California, and many others are coming to realize that we are we must recognize that anti-black racism is a national health crisis. Yep. A national health crisis. And I want to just bring our attention to the fact that we are grieving multiple traumas at once, and we can barely sort it out. We can, we can think about the murder of George Floyd and the way that that struck us. We can think about Armand Aubrey. We can think about all these incredible atrocities that we've witnessed, but we also must come to understand that we are, we, we are constantly grieving. As black people in this country, we are, we're walking around because we're not safe at home. We're not safe on the road, in the grocery store. We're not safe, it doesn't feel safe. Imagine that anxiety, that trauma that comes with that. We have to acknowledge this pain. And sometimes because there's so many traumas mixed up together, we don't even know if we have a right to be sad. We don't know what we're, which part of it we're sad about at any given time. So we're struggling with owning that sadness. But once we do, once we come to terms with that, we can begin to think about what we need to do to heal and know that it, we have the right to put our attention yes. towards healing, right? We have the right. And I say this in every space I go into because it's something I'm trying to claim as a black man living in a white supremacist society. And that is, I have the right to care for myself. I have the right to take time out to heal my, my mind and my body and my spirit. I have the right to, to turn some attention towards me as I'm, re, as I'm negotiating these multiple traumas. And so this is, the, this is the thing I would say to all of us is how can we heal, help, and do the work we need to do if we're not taking care of ourselves? This goes for everybody. And so I think the healing is there for all of us. And we're not talking about it enough. We're not talking about it enough. And I'm talking about black people and white people. We yeah. all want relief from stress. White people are stressed out too. They may not be as stressed in the same way, but they stressed out too. I extend that chip because that stress is very much coming across as paralysis in what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You know, people do we're having to have conversations about well, how do we do this? What do we do? And conversations have been happening for centuries. So mm -hmm. the paralysis that is there and leaders not knowing where to turn and wanting to ask questions, but not wanting to provide space and give space, mm -hmm. it affects everybody. So in, yeah. in racial healing, as Chip shared, it's necessary for everyone. It is a requirement for so many, so many of us, because in this system, none of us are truly valued the way that we should be. That's right. But even those who believe they benefit from it, right? Yes. None of us. But cool, I want to say one thing. When people cannot skip to the healing part if they haven't acknowledged and owned the trauma. That they've called. Yep, own the trauma, own right? the truth. Own yes, the sir. trauma, own the truth. Don't try to skip that step. Don't mm -hmm. try to skip that step. Say, oh, what can we do for reconciliation? Yeah. You know, that's, that's fine. called silencing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And that's and that in itself is a microaggression to not sit with the pain that you've caused and the and the trauma that white supremacist society has inflicted upon too many people of color. We must own that and then we can move into the healing space. Thank you, Chip, and thank you, Quo. Yes. We're all in the same storm, but not in the same boat. And mm. Black Americans uh, ha are in a constant state of trauma, and they have the right to heal. We want to hear their truth. We want to hear the truth. They should acknowledge that truth before we can find the path to healing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I have a follow-up for, for Quo. So Quo, in your expert opinion, why should arts organizations, particularly opera companies, 
why should they be taking the lead on establishing equity on stage and in the administrative offices as well? That's a loaded question. I am going to approach different parts of that question from different angles. I caution the idea that we should take the lead because sometimes that is misconstrued or misunderstood as we know best, therefore follow us. We have very much in white supremacy culture of perfectionism, of the right to comfort, of follow us, we know what to do, right? All of these combinations, sense of urgency, all these things come together. If we are to take the lead in anything, it should be in how we silence our own egos as an art form and learn from the beautiful things that our art form can do. I say so often opera is the plural of opus. That is the plural of multiple works. We put together multiple works. It makes no sense not to be able to put together multiple communities, to tell multiple stories, to provide multiple experiences, to provide multiple connections. We are in our own way in so many ways because you know we're opera. We, we put it all there. We make amazing things happen. But for whom? By whom? With whom, right? So as we look at this, opera organizations, not so much as taking the lead, but definitely having a relentless commitment to ensuring that we are creating spaces of belonging and that we're getting out of our own way and allowing the art form to do what it does best. In order to do that, we are organizations, we're made of people, therefore we should center people. As we center people, that includes those who are doing the work, that includes the administrative offices, that includes what happens internally, that includes what happens externally, that includes how we engage with communities. We have our hands in so many places without truly feeling anything, to be honest, right? So yeah, we should be an example. Mm -hmm. And that example should be one of listening. That example should be one of reverence. It should be one of learning, always, ever the student. And it should be one of truly being a vessel so that the work that we do can mean something, not just to those doing the work, but to those who are receiving the work, those who are engaging with the work. Got it, thank you, Chloe. So yes, do your part as an organization, uh, lead the way by listening, uh, but also by silencing your ego. Chip, do you have anything to offer? Oh, I, I was gonna try to hold back, but you invited me in. I'm just gonna say this because it's huge and I, I re really need this to land. You cannot use the same tools and strategies you use to create an oppressive art form and context to solve it. Mm. You cannot use the same tools to solve the problem that you use to create the problem. I'm, I love that our white allies are motivated, they're activated, they're involved, they're engaged, they care, they know it matters, we've made our case, but you must let black people lead. You must let people of color lead. You must let experts lead because you are trying to apply the same tools and strategies you use to create the structures, to dismantle the structures, and it's not possible. Thank you, Audre Lord. You can't do it, it doesn't work that way. The tools of oppression cannot dismantle them. So what I'm trying to say is, I am still noticing people not accepting and not understanding a certain degree of humility that mm. must be part of this process. Because the difference in thinking, the, di the, 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 um, the ways in which we need to approach this dynamically, creatively, uh, from a healing perspective, is going to come from the experts that we're talking about, the people and the people of color who are going to bring that different perspective. Please understand and find a way to not step out of the game, stay in the game, but know that you can't lead it. And I'm really trying to emphasize this because it's happening everywhere around me. And I want to lovingly, I don't want to push them away, but I want them to know there's a way to be engaged without taking charge. Got it. Thank you so much. So, Quo, yeah. um, you had something to say. Yes. And in that, in building, Chip, Chip and I are always here. <laughs> in, in, in building on that, I encourage everyone to get out of binary thinking. Yes. Which is a white supremacy culture norm. Get out of the either or. Either I am leading or I'm not a part of this. Right. Either I am guiding and telling everybody what to do, I am delegating or I am incompetent. Right. Yeah. And as we move into this, it, just talk to my staff about this. 
this afternoon. It is important that we understand we are valuable in every single space. The ways in which we show up in that space changes. We have to have the flexibility and the humility to know that in some spaces, it is not your place to speak, but to feel, but to hold space with others, but to connect, but to be in silence, but to make way and then move out of the way. In other spaces, it is your role to move forward, to speak up. What you do in one space does not mean you will do it in another because that is a form of supremacy. If you feel that your voice should always be centered, that's a form of supremacy. And supremacy makes no sense. So don't do those things. So it's, <laughs> don't do these things. So it's a matter, as Chip said, as we are wanting to make sure that one, those whom we identify as allies, you cannot self-identify as an ally. I cannot self-identify as an ally for the Latinidad community, nor can I do it for the Asian community, nor can I do it for the American Indian or Native American community, right? Even if I, I ride for, the, for everybody all day, every day, I cannot mm. self-identify as an uh, ally. Those who are celebrated and honored get to measure when they are celebrated and honored. Mm. So if we are doing that, that requires that those who do not have that lived experience, those who cannot speak to it, those who literally don't know what to do because you've been in a system that allowed you to ignore how everyone else is living, it's okay to move aside. It is okay to still be in the space, to still share space, and it's okay to expand the roles and the ways that you connect with others. That's my, that my to taking the lead on establishing equity on stage is to make the way and then get out of the way. Mm. Got it. Okay. I want to shift you to Victoria here for a second. So Victoria, can you speak about your experience being part of an opera from a sister's point of view? What have you learned? Can you tell us anything about what you've learned from this program? And of course, please provide some personal background. Uh, about yourself? Of course. So um, I was born and raised in Heightsville, Maryland. We have a really big um, Black, African-American, African and Latinx community. So, um, and also a white community. So I was actually, um, as a child, I was around all walks of life. It was actually really wonderful. Um, and for a very long time, I was stuck in a bubble. And um, it's so interesting when you come out of that bubble and um, you go to, you know, a predominantly white school, um, college, um, and see how many people don't look like you. Um, and you see how many people on staff don't look like you. Um, it's it's kind of an eye opener, and um, it really is um, something that makes you take a step back and 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 makes you think, wow. Um, the bubble that I was living in was wonderful, and this is not how the rest of the world is. Um, and I felt like opera from a sister's point of view was one of the most memorable um, moments of my career thus far. Um, it was just wonderful to be around so many beautiful, very, very, what's the word? Um, just amazing black singers in all different walks of their careers. They're singing for houses and singing in spaces that I hope to sing for very soon. And just to see them kind of be in their element, um, see them do what they do best. Um, and then us interacting in rehearsals and not having to to go around and, and be a different person. We can all act like ourselves and we can talk like ourselves and um, we can say things and make jokes and act crazy. And it was it was really just an amazing experience. And I think it it really speaks to how um, how beautiful diversity can be and how accessing the, the different walks of life and putting them in one space can be. Um, I. It, it made me think that this has so much power. Diversity has so much power, especially for this art form. Because if you're constantly not thinking about the other people, you know, and you're saying, what can I do to make sure that opera is preserved and all we're thinking about is white spaces? Mm -hmm. Well, what about all the other people? You wonder why people are not going to see opera that are not white, you know? You're wondering, well, how can I get opera into the inner city schools and all this kind of stuff? Well, if you put people on stage that look like them, you know, maybe they would realize that it's possible. If you put people, you know, in 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 positions of administration um, and and artistic directors and directors and conductors, and they saw that, they would think that's possible. Um, and I think that 
we've been blessed that we have, we are now starting to see even more black opera singers in the forefront of this art form, but we need to see more behind the scenes because I think they can also do so much work for the performers on stage. And they can also make sure that we are getting opera to the kids so that this art form can live and have the longevity that it deserves. Got it, thank you. So opera, uh, diversity on stage is, truly beautiful, but diversity behind the stage and on stage can be truly powerful. Thank you for that. Now, I have a question for Chip and Quo, uh, because you have some similarities outside of, you know, opinions and, and, and expertise on this subject matter. You both are passionate about dance as an art form. Are there actions and lessons around racial justice and equity from the dance community that opera can learn from. Chip. Chip, you're on mute. You know, I'm I'm moved by this um, notion that I know has come to the forefront of the availability of, of makeup being in the shade of brown that you come in and how opera companies have historically not always been uh, have the presence of mind to to have makeup. Yeah, makeup on the stage. You're a professional artist and you get to the theater and they don't have your shade of brown because they didn't intend, they don't understand that we come in a multiplicity of colors and a range of them and to find the right one takes time and it takes attention. And so what that reminds me of is this, and I, I'm gonna get to the dance part, is the fact that this is one more way in which we have dishonored the black body. This is one more way we have dishonored people of color. This is one more way we have dehumanized and, and pathologized the body through a microaggression. Listen, dance and movement is about life. It's about the human body. It's about understanding that our racialized history has demonized, policed, and demeaned the black body. Policing during slavery was invented. The very point of policing was to police black bodies. So learning to know, learning to respect, learning to care for your black body, your body of brown, whatever beautiful shade of beige it comes in, takes a lifetime because there's wisdom and there's knowledge and there's stories locked in our DNA. And I know that some of my black brothers and sisters, uh, they do, they feel a sense of hopelessness uh, because they are embedded in a white supremacy culture that tells them that their black presence, their black identity is not rich enough. It's not worthy. And this is the thing that must be changed. And so what happens through dance, what happens through movement is you not only learn the communicative potential of dance as a way of expressing in the theater, on the stage and beyond, you begin to learn this and appreciate and respect this vessel, this vessel that you have to live in from birth to death your whole entire life. You have to come to love it. You have to come to terms with it. And dance and movement can do that. It can usher in healing an awareness and a, and a way of, of using that as a tool for creativity, which can empower you. That's, that's some of my thinking. Well, thank you. Quo, would you like to add anything? Speak on it, Chip. <laughs> Speak on it. Uh, my 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 role for dance comes in that of of a supporter, that of a not a trained dancer, but that of a dancer, that of understanding that movement is as natural as breathing. Our breath is a dance in its own way, in the ways that we come into space. And just as Chip said, being able to engage with your body and being able to engage in the ability to move, the ability to breathe, the ability to experience art inherent, because that's what it is. Opera can learn from these dance communities in the ways that there are specific spaces that allow for people to engage in who they are, the way they are. Not to say that dance just has it all figured out because no, <laughs> no. But the ways in which art inherent takes place in so many communities, we as an art form can learn from that. It is very rare that we find spaces now where people are not able to dance, right? It is very rare that we find spaces now where people are not able to encourage some form of dancing. The same is true for the ways that we make music. We are concerned about the death of our art form 
And it's not our art form that is at stake. It's the white led institutions that will die. Yeah. Opera's gonna be here. Opera's been here for over 400 years. It's Opera's making it. And people are making opera and creating opera. So as we embrace what it means to be in community, what it means to be in movement with one another, as you see, I keep moving, right? <laughs> as we embrace what it means to be in movement with one another, what it means to be in sync with one another, that is something that we have to take as opera and also understand that it's something that's already embedded within opera, right? It's the plural of opus. Mm -hmm. Dance is already a part of opera. So again, we have to get out of our own way and pay attention to the ways that others are creating spaces of belonging, knowing that while we have additional layers because of this opera, we have all the much more richness in how deeply we can connect with people and how deeply our spaces of belonging can last and be authentic as we spread this out, right? Outside of just those who are currently gatekeeping, <laughs> who are currently hoarding or who are currently asking questions for decades, the same questions for decades, of the same individuals. So that is my. Well, thank you. Thank you for offering that. I am happy to hear that you believe that opera is going to be here for a long time. Cincinnati Opera just um, celebrated its 100th uh, year of existence. It is the second oldest opera in the country. And yes, we look forward to the next 100. So thank you uh, for offering your perspective on what we can learn from the dance community. Now, I'm gonna throw out a statistic here. So 60% of college students report that racial tensions have impacted their mental health. 60% of college students. We know that the arts can heal, right? Are there particular works that you have added to the repertoire of your respective companies? Are there new works being created that's addressing this need? And I'm going to throw this question to Chip. You know, that's a big question. And I'm actually very interested to hear what Victoria might have to say about this. Um, because it's it's not a long, it's not a slow, it's not an easy process, right? Getting a work from conception to the stage. Everybody knows that three to five years is 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 very typical. The idea that we're working in this in this uh, really critical time in which we're putting works on the stage faster is 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 remarkable, and we're still adapting. Um, are they, have those works all made it to the stage yet? Not yet. Are new works being developed as a result of the 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 impact of the racial unrest? Yes. Will they make a difference? Yes. <laughs> yes, because there are two ways in which art heals, right? It's both from the art making perspective, the ways in which art is a way of, of using voice, of expression, of ideas, of communicating that no other art form can do it right? You dance because you have to. You sing because you have to. This is a way in which your soul expresses itself. So each person finding that is an important part. Now, the other part of it is the works you're talking about on the stage have to do with the fact that art as an experience can be cathartic. It can inform us. It can educate us. It can bring us up. It can let us down softly. It is a way of experiencing the world. So the, the plurality, the diversity of artworks that we can bring to the stage makes that much more, makes it that much more accessible to diverse communities and marginalized populations. And it's incredibly important. Will a single artwork do it? No. No, it is, it, there is a multi, there, there, it's a systems impact, right? There are multiple uh, levels in which we must interrupt injustice, interrupt inequity, create spaces. Like just going into that space, like, like say you put a beautiful opera on the stage that is from, you know, a, a marginalized community, you know, a black opera. And then if you go to the theater, who's going to greet you? Who's going to sit next to you? Who's going to welcome you? How comfortable do you feel? Can you chat? These are all the things that we have to think about in terms of creating a context in which people have the same access to the healing uh, potential that art makes. Mm. Um, so it, it's a complicated question. I don't know. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. So now I am curious to hear what Victoria has to say, too. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, it's so interesting because I, I want to say that um, when I went to undergrad, um, when I when I got my undergraduate degree, I was very um, 
I was I was definitely seeing that there were very not very many people that looked like me, as I said before. Um, I I had a wonderful experience in undergrad. It was also kind of like a bubble. It was a very small school. Um, so I had really great teachers that invested in me. Um, but we did have one black teacher on faculty there. Mm. And he was wonderful. And it was always nice to to know that if I needed, if I had an issue, if I needed music. If I, you know, I had to go to someone um, and talk about racial issues, I, I could go to this person. Um, it's so interesting when you go to an institution and you're supposed to learn and you're supposed to soak up all the education you can. But as a black person, a black or brown person, um, the the works that are that are composed and made by black and brown people aren't talked about in in class. Um, mm -hmm. In song literature, you don't have a section where you talk about black or brown African um, or black or brown American composers. Um, you're constantly talking about uh, Wolf and Liszt and Beethoven. And, um, you know, even when we get to American art song, black composers are never talked about. Um, I remember um, an undergrad always going to this one teacher because I knew that he had the music because a lot of this is not public domain yet or it's hard to get at the library. Um, it's just so interesting to see how inaccessible <laughs> your existence is in an institution. Um, and you kind of have to play around that. You have to do with, you know, do with what you've been given. Um, and as I got older and as I got to grad school, I more so was not relying on the institution anymore. I was more relying on myself. Um, and that's great that I was able to do that, but I shouldn't have to do that. Um, and uh, I just think that, that it's really interesting that even now, I'm glad we're having these conversations. I feel like they need to be had. People need to be teaching them in, in school. Um, it's crazy that I have to name a black composer and people are like, I don't know who that is. And um, I can name, a white composer and they're like, oh yeah, of course. Um, I feel like that needs to stop because they are a part of the history as well. Our our existence is the is also a part of the history and it should be talked about. Got it. Thank you. And and you know, as we are celebrating, you know, Black History Month, you know, this is the only time that I hear about, you know, the true accomplishments of uh, some black Americans and, 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 and yes, I agree. You know, these uh, conversations should start in the classroom. We should be talking about um, the accomplishments of black composers in the classroom. Yeah, so thank you for that. Now, Quo, I didn't give you a, a shot at this question. Do you want to take one? I actually have more questions in response to that. Um, <laughs> what, which students, 60%, which students were surveyed? I have questions. And in what Chip expressed, people experience things differently. So the art that we create and the art making that has to happen, that has yet to happen, that has started to happen, that is how we will address things. No, as Chip said, no one opera is not going to assist with racial tension, opera space will not change much when you leave the opera space and you still have to go back into the systemic oppression, the systematic oppression, because a lot of it is still intentional. We want to acknowledge that. So as we look at what works and what pieces, I encourage everyone to consider the art making process, the work that will address these things. Not a work, not a piece especially when so many works and so many pieces are about trauma. That's not gonna, I, I know about the trauma. You don't need to tell me more about trauma. I promise I know. My, my, my father knows it's generational. There's been passed down in ways that won't even show up on the opera stage. So rather than what works or what pieces, I encourage all opera companies to consider the art making process and the work of art making as ways in which we can address the tension and address the stress that so many are considering. Create spaces and environments. Let that be your art that addresses and that helps us to heal from the racial tensions or the racial stress, the racial issues. Oh, Victoria, I gotta go, go for it. Um, you said something that just reminded me of something I wanted to say. And I wanted to piggyback off of that. I find that 
Um, when people think of black stories, black and brown stories, there's one way of telling it. Um, I find that sometimes we get pigeonholed and we think that a black opera means singing jazz or like singing this, singing that. And I'm, and there's a space for that. There's absolutely a space for that. But I think there is also a space for, even though it is a Eurocentric art form, there is a space for, for black and brown people to sing in the style um, and have those also be black stories. And it breaks my heart when, um, you know, when, I don't want young people to see black stories being told that way and then think, oh, well, that's the only way a black story has to be told in the, in the art form for it to be accessible or for it to be for black and brown people. There are ways for the, the more Eurocentric um, um, common way of opera to be done and also be it and also have it be a black story. There are ways to do that. And I wish there were more of that. I love that. I, I want to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump right in here with you, Victoria, <laughs> because as soon as you think black opera, it's like, okay, it's no longer classical. It's jazz, it's spiritual, it's everything else. And we're gonna talk about, you know, the trauma of the black experience through this lens. Two, a well, couple of things. A, we can sing classical music. B, we have more than trauma. We are more than our trauma. We are more than our trauma. We are more than our trauma. That was for the- Say it again, say it again, say it again. More. One more time, Chip. We are more than our trauma. We have the we have the same wealth, breadth, and depth of, of the human experience as everybody has. And don't just put one black opera. See, you turn me on now. Don't put one black opera on stage and say, we did it. We had one black, we had one black opera last season. We're good. Let's go. I mean, one I'm, is not enough. One is not true. enough. Yes. You know, we get the month of February to talk about black history. Imagine if we only talked about white history in May. Only talk about, you can talk about any other culture, but you can only talk about white Eurocentric history in the month of May. How does that feel? Well, mm -hmm. it feels like to us. Mm -hmm. Very demeaning. We understand why it was created, and in the absence of nothing, something is better, but it's not okay. I do not take speaking engagements in the month of February. You know why? Because I'm not going to buy into your your space, which you're creating for me, that's about this narrow with 26 days, the shortest day, the shortest month of the year. And you're going to talk about Black history. So I'm sorry, I've, I've got I've dovetailed into too many things. But I, <laughs> no, no, that's great. And I and I and I have to say, yeah. And and I well, you just mentioned you don't take any speaking engagement. So I have to thank you again for taking this speaking engagement. Uh, I am so sorry that we asked you in the month of February. We'll never do that again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, I want to go to the next question because, you know, we've touched on why representation is important, right? Uh, how opera companies can do better, uh, you know, having proper representation in the work they produce, the creative teams, the cast, the administration. Um, you know, we've talked about that a little bit. I want to go to Victoria again um, to build on this, you know, you know, as a performer, from your performer's perspective, what effect would proper or improper representation from the creative team, administrators of a company, et cetera, have on your experience? And I know you've touched on it, but, but I just wanted to, to pose that question again. Yeah, so I, again, I just really feel like to see more facets of life behind the scenes, um, you just, it just, it, it's a matter of comfort. I know that like someone is fighting for me. I know that someone is looking out for me mm -hmm. and I don't have to always look out for myself. Mm -hmm. um, we all need help. You know, we're not all perfect. So it's always good to have someone else on your team, on your administration, on the board that understands, that can explain that can clarify you need to do your own homework and you need to do your own research you need to do your own reading but um you have someone that has either lived an experience that can that can speak on it and that can and kind of own it and explain it to you so that you can in your humility take it in do what you need to do with it and move on. Um, and in doing so, the preconceived notions of how our society should be will no longer just come easily. You will start to question things. You will start to see things differently. And in, in, in doing that, 
we will be able to dissect and dismantle the system that we currently are living in. Um, I also find that on stage, um, kind of going back to this idea of like black stories, in, in the repertoire, non-black stories, um, stories that are originally for black people, Aida, you know, Nobuko, all of these stories, um, I am more than comfortable than, uh, with seeing different walks of life, seeing those roles, but you don't need to put them in blackface, okay? You don't need, I, I mean, we, we're, being, we're being real out here. You don't need to put them in blackface. You don't need to give them a cornrow wig. I promise you their wavy hair is just fine because when we go, when we step into the opera house, it is, we all know this is a world of imagination. I can see past. I can see past that. If the Aida is a white woman, I can see past that. I really can. Now, should we be hiring black Aidas? Yes. But <laughs> in, in the space, I, I, I can, I understand, but you don't need to paint her a different color for me to imagine that she's Aida because I know for a fact that she is. I'm watching the show. Mm -hmm. We're, audience members are much smarter than we think they are and they don't need all of that uh, trying to get, if you want to do all that, you might as well have hired a black singer. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I think that um, that on top of what's happening behind the scenes is super, super important. Then people will understand this is not okay. I can't just let this slide by and this is fine. I'll just put it in the back of my head and we won't talk about it. It's something that needs to be addressed, something that needs to go. And we need to continue to add more black and brown people, people of color on and off the stage to continue to help this process. More black and brown people, no more blackface. Yes, we heard you. Everybody else out there heard you too. I have one more question prepared for you tonight before we take a few questions from the audience, and that is uh, directed to Chip and Quo. What can opera companies embrace within their educational departments, within their educational programs that will offer the opportunity to engage teachers, students in topics of racial uh, healing, racial justice and equity? Um, how have your education programs evolved in, in, to include this focus in the last couple of months. Mm. Chip? Yes, thank you for that. But this is such an important question. Um, and I feel very strongly about it. And I'm gonna just keep my emotions in check only because during this time of being out of school, uh, black and brown children have been disproportionately negatively impacted and will be for years to come, years to come. And um, given that we already had educational disparities, given that we already were at the bottom of the rung, given that we already were academically challenged, uh, according to the statistics, I, I have challenged with that. Uh, but, but given that circumstance, we are now further behind. And this, so the curriculum, the only curriculum to me right now is healing. Healing is the curriculum. We must not diminish the impact of our collective trauma, our collective impact, and the potential for our collective healing. And so as it comes to thinking about and making sure that our programs are grounded in social justice, are paying attention to social emotional learning, are embracing culturally and linguistically responsive teaching, um, and that we are, we are centering cultural competency that we are doing whatever we need to do beyond just teaching our curriculum to, uh, to awaken and support and enliven student voice, literally and figuratively. It is all about making space to be seen, to be heard, and for that capacity of healing to take place in and through the arts. Thank you, Chip, wow. Quo? Yes, Chip. I'm going to first and foremost say our opera companies need to value our education and community departments. Let's start there. And let's start <laughs> there as not as the the grant, right? The the the, the thing that gets the grant, 
not as the part of the the organization that we go to when we just want to engage the the younger ones education goes across the board that includes education within the organization as well so before any education or community engagement outreach department of any opera company can even fix itself to start to go into another community or to go into schools to go into homes to go into anywhere to speak about racial equity, racial justice, and social equity, education is necessary for the organization itself. You cannot profess what you do not know, mm. right? Mm -hmm. You cannot share, you cannot speak about things you do not know. That includes those who are leading these same departments with an inability to understand what cultural competency is, what cultural humility is. If you are not already aligned in these things, you are not serving your community. Let's talk about that. If you are not already aligned in these things, you're not serving your community because you are perpetuating and sharing an image that is damaging to everyone who engages because you're continuously perpetuating the idea that others are belong here, certain people belong in. So as we embrace the things that we need to do for our organizations, our organizations first and foremost need to gain their own education and their own commitment to valuing education and then extending that out into the ways that we engage with our communities, the ways that we engage with students of all ages. In addition to that, for us uh, in particular, because I've been with Dallas Opera for so long, there's not been much involved or evolution in how we approach those things because we already understood that to begin with. Those are the cultural things that you don't have to worry about, that you don't have to learn. I knew what it meant to be a little black kid who was like, well, can I do opera? I knew what it meant to be someone who was wondering whether or not I belonged in the space and whether or not I could be included in the space. I also knew what it meant to see someone who does not look like me next to someone who does look like me. So that's the things that we center. We center valuing individuals, the entire individuals and in dismantling white supremacy systems so that we provide spaces that center learning in a space of healing. We don't prioritize the art, we prioritize the individual. We prioritize the connection. We prioritize the potential. And that's of every age, that's of every group. We prioritize the ways in which this art and we ourselves are vessels to be able to connect. So again, kind of that mentality of how do we lead? No, 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 right? First we learn, we understand, we commit, and then we do it all over again. We listen first and foremost, right? We mm -hmm. listen, and then we have the humility to shift the things that need to be done, knowing that the connections are there to support everyone in the work that needs to be done. Thank you, Quo. Opera Company, you've heard it here first. A lot of challenges we have discussed and a lot of opportunities uh, of how we can break down some barriers and do better, uh, you know, in the in the months, in the weeks, the months, the years ahead. I do want to take uh, a quick shift here to field some questions from the audience. And um, I will start with a question about what are barriers to entry what are barriers to entry that a potential audience member might face chip i know you touch on this a little bit but how can we work on eliminating those barriers yes um you know this is something that i'm starting to think about that our organization is starting to think about very critically especially as we contemplate returning back to live performances what inhibits what uh, uh, pe diverse populations from participating in opera? What can what happens in the experience in the theater going experience? And it has to do with um, the way people dress, right? It's like if, if I don't have a black suit, am I still allowed to go? Can I go in my jeans? And if so, what are the usher going to say? And what are the other patrons going to do when they look at me? And so, what I'm becoming aware of in this paradigm. And if there's some, there's one piece I will I will emphasize, is the fact that our audiences must develop humility and compassion for those who are newly coming to experience this work. We have we have we have a box that we have in. You know the same old same old. You know who sits in seat 24A, 
because you've been sitting there for the last five years. You have a tick. You're a season ticket holder. That's great. But guess what? On the other side of you, there's somebody who's never been before. How do you greet them? How do you welcome them? How do you ask them if there's a way you can make their experience better? How can our audiences be part of and engaged in creating an atmosphere that's welcoming and belonging? This is something that I think we must do. This is something I think we must attend to. Yes, I want diverse uh, ushers. I want uh, diverse people in the front of the house. So as soon as you get there, you see black and brown people, tall and short, big and, and, and small. You see this diversity. But I also want uh, our audience members to grow with us mm. and to come to a place where they are not othering people, but instead are inviting them to become another one of them. Got it. Thank you so much. Victoria, you want to offer? Yes, I just wanted to say we have to remember that this art form was specifically created for the common people. This art form was originally made for the common people until we started to think that it became an elitist art form. We were singing for the people in the nosebleed seats. We were singing for the people that didn't have the money to get those orchestra seats. Caruso would sing for the people in the back, you know, so we have to get back to that mentality that it, it is not other. We're not, I'm not better than you because I got this seat versus I got this seat. We have to realize that we are all very small in this community, that the art form is what, what brings us all together. And without the art form, we are nothing. So we need to get back to the humility of it all and realize that we're not better than the next person. We are all on the same. This is this is opera. We're going to go see opera. You're not better than me because you're sitting in orchestra seat C100, whatever, A, and you got your fur coat on. If I'm wearing jeans, I'm here just like you, okay? Got it. Thank you, Victoria. We have a few more questions. Uh, so if it's okay with anyone, I will go ahead and pose them. Excuse me? There are lots of good questions. Oh, my God. Yes, so, so a question from Carlos. Quo and Chip, thank you for being here and sharing your wisdom. What are some things you've battled with being black in the arts admin field? What have you done? Or what would you tell uh, PWI organizations to make their BIPOC employees safer and or more empowered? Quo, you get this first. Okay. First of all, thank you very much, Carlos, for your question and hello. Thank you for joining us. What are some of the things I've battled? The Right now, especially because of my role as an equity specialist, the battle, and not just with uh, white coworkers, but the battle is fighting against the supremacy culture, right? What I tell PWIs and all individuals is that we have to look at the way things are and then start to question that. We have to be bold and curious and how we look at why things are the way they are as opposed to just accepting them and continuing, or as opposed to just being silent and holding progress hostage because that's what happens when white people get uncomfortable and they don't wanna talk about it anymore mm -hmm. because they don't have to, they can just go off and then tomorrow you'll do something else. You know, you wake up, go to work and then you're, you're done. You were uncomfortable for a few moments, you feel good about being uncomfortable and then you go on, you know. So just understanding that this is not about feelings, this is not about momentary discomfort. This is about addressing ways that people's lives are at stake. This is about addressing ways that people are not valued the same way. This is about addressing the ways that we are separated and the ways we continue to be separated. So to make everyone feel safer, I rarely use safe because safe for some is not safe for everybody else. To some, safe means, okay, I won't, I won't be uncomfortable in this space and mm -hmm. not with racial healing, not in healing spaces. We're gonna, we're gonna go through that. We're gonna go through that journey together. So to make everyone feel as if they belong, to feel empowered, I encourage WIs, I encourage everyone to sit in it, to honor silence, just like we do in music. Those rests are just as beautiful as the notes, right? Sit in silence rest in it, remove your voice from the center. When you feel the need to defend, speak up. When you feel the need to silence yourself and your own lived experiences and the ways that you need to share the ways that you yourself are also suffering from this. So that is what I often tell everyone. 
Mm -hmm. And don't rush the process. Your your sense of urgency to have KPIs <laughs> still a form of white supremacy. Right. right? Uh, thank you. Quote. Um, your sense of urgency to have KPIs is misguided. I'm just going to anchor what my sister just said. You're rushing towards um, calibrating something because it brings you comfort. Something you know. If you've done it before and you can say you achieved something, but it's not real. It's not real if you haven't healed the relationships, if you haven't dealt with the, the parts of you inside of you that has bias, that has bigotry, that has that that is importing uh, uh, microaggressions on a regular basis and you're un, unaware of it. So when people ask me like what what kind of hurts or what kind of that we've experienced, it's this is a multiplicity of, of ways we can't even begin to describe it. It happens on every level in every in every fashion. But here's the thing I would say, and, and I have said this to my my own uh, team and, and to uh, the, the leaders of, of SFO. Um, give me the same time, tools and resources to uh, address inequity and oppression as you give to do other things you care about. That's how I'm watching you. That's how I'm holding you accountable. Give me the same time, tools, and resources. That's what you can do. That's something you can do. And then for my black, for my white brothers and sisters, you know, there's, there's this moment where you feel that, you know, the, the, there's no action happening. There's no, there's no drama in the news and you feel like you don't know what to do. There's always something to do. <laughs> if you're not reading and dialoguing and, and, com and contemplating and reflecting and doing what Quo said, sitting with questions that asks you to notice your privilege and notice the ways in which you are perpetuating the same injustices. If you're not doing that, then you're not doing the work. And you should, and this won't end. This is not, is, you don't go work out, get in shape and you're like, I'm in shape for the rest of my life. Thank you, I'm good. No, you have to keep going back to the gym. You have to keep going back. A singer keeps practicing every day, Yeah. yeah. right? So don't tell me that you're tired and don't tell me you don't know what to do because there's there's an unending amount of resources that where you should be constantly learning and dialoguing and the dialogue is no small thing because that is where you notice and and can talk about and can grapple with difference and and variety and perspective um anyway mm -hmm. carlos i really appreciate your question it's a good one and it's a complex one but at the yeah. very least, if we are really addressing uh, uh, bias and microaggressions, you're going to create a safer place, maybe mm -hmm. not the safest, but a safer place than yeah. it would be otherwise. And thank give us. You, and thank you, Cohen. Thank you, Carlos, for posing the question. Um, we're going to take a few more questions. I know we are over the hour that we said we would be here, but these are good conversations. So we're going to continue for just a little bit. I have a question for Victoria from Christy. Um, I believe I once heard you talk, Victoria, this is you. I, someone heard you talk about how would love, how you would love to sing Tosca, but felt you would not get the opportunity. Are we, do you feel like we're getting closer to a day when casting will consider the best singer? Hmm. Okay. Great question, Christy. So, um, I believed in my heart of hearts that I would never sing Tosca because of my particular voice type. So I would, if anyone would cast me as Tosca, I'm going, you know, <laughs> um, because I love that role so, so very much. Um, but I love this question. Are we getting closer to a day when casting will consider the best singer? Mm. <laughs> you know, I want to say the answer is yes. But from what I have seen, I'm not sure yet. You know, I feel like it is where we're getting there. I want us to, to get to the point where we still very much see the differences. I don't want you to, to, um, to blind cast. That's not a thing. I want you to see that I'm black. I want yes. you to see me. Yes. I want you to see me, okay? I want you to see that I'm black. I want you to see that I'm a full-figured black woman. I want you to see all of it. I want I want you to see that this is what, you know, this is who I am. And then I want you to hear me sing. And then I want you to think that she is the best candidate for this because she has everything she needs to offer vocally. And she's an amazing musician. That is 
I believe that is the criteria because I do believe that the voice comes first. Now we get to this age sometimes where people think that appearance is all that matters. And there's this idea of colorism too. We're not going to get into that, but you know, the lighter you are, the more appealing you are on stage, Mm -hmm. but which is why I don't know if the answer is yes. I, I still think we have a long way to go. And I think that that, that road has to be traveled with the dismantling of the system. We need to realize that there is not, that that me being a certain skin tone and me not being light enough, passing the paper the bag test, the brown paper bag test, doesn't you know motivate me to be the person that you choose because of this or that. I just feel like, I don't know the answer to that question yet, Chrissy, and I, I hope that we get closer in years to come where that is no longer a question that we have to ask. Yeah. You're probably Thank you. <laughs> Can I just say one thing about what you just said? Um, because we there's a there's a phrase going around in the black in the black community, and we don't want you not not only do we not want you to be colorblind, we want you to be color aware. Like she said, see her beautiful blackness, see her beautiful uh, 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 copper tone, whatever it is. But here's the thing, this idea of being able to sing Tosca and who has the best voice. I've been talking about this in these artistic circles. Let me tell you, the prejudice slash bias is in, oh, you know, when I hear, when I, and we, we don't know how it's influenced, I hear a certain timbre in the voices of people of color. I hear a different tonality. I hear a different resonance, Uh, all these other things. So the aesthetic of what you think is a good voice or a great voice must also be addressed. If you don't sound white and Eurocentric and European enough, is that the aesthetic you're talking about? Or are you talking about the beauty and the well-roundedness of a full voice, beautiful black singer who can sing Tosca as well as anybody else? I think we have to address this artistic bias that comes in the nuance of how we think of the great opera voice. Victoria, we see you. We know you are a beautiful black woman. We see you. (laughs) Thank you, I appreciate it. We have a few more questions. Um, The next question is, what do you say to organizations who may feel that the process of implementing DE and I practices drains resources and takes away from their familiar and comfortable existence. Quote. I say you are making excuses and either you're going to do this work or you will not. I say do not waste people's time and expect people to come into an opera house to be insulted. Mm. I say that it is okay to change. Your familiar and comfortable existence, and this is just within human nature in the ways in which we resist change, but in the ways in which we adapt so that we can continue to not just survive, but thrive. Mm. You will be left behind. We are beyond the age of asking permission. This is a come along with us. You can move if you want, or you cannot. Completely up to you. You will look up and you will be surrounded in ways that are not as beneficial as you had, as you had hoped, right? So in this, either you're doing the work or you are not. And if providing resources to ensure that you are doing the best for this art form, this does not mean that we have to completely dismiss canon. We're in a field of creatives, right? We put a hole in the wall and we go play pretend. You cannot tell me you do not have the creativity because I know you do, I believe in you, I know you do. Do not have the creativity to find solutions, to find solutions with others, to find solutions in which your comfort does not come in your existence and the ways in which you, in many ways have benefited from stolen land and stolen labor because this entire nation does. Because how hard did you work when you got a leg up? Let's talk about it. Stolen land, stolen labor, even in historic practices, right? So in the ways in which others have been purposely kept out, do you want to continue that? Mm. And I know you don't. Truly on the inside, I know you do not. So as we're looking at that, do not make excuses. Find ways to implement real change. And I say real change as in you start to look at policies. You start to make sacrifices because this is going to look and feel different. Mm. This 
but a world we know that we have experience in different spaces. We're just trying to make that experience consistent in so many spaces so that others can experience it with us. So when we say implement those real changes, this is not a completely wa a complete wash of everything of the organization, but be real about the things that truly need to change. Be mm -hmm. real about the sacrifices that truly need to be made because honestly, they're not serving you either. They never were. Thank you, Thank you Chloe. Me. So moral of the story, no more excuses, real change now. Thank you. I have one more question from Carlos. Very popular, Carlos. Uh, and this is addressed to Quo, Chip, and Victoria. How can our audiences now and in the future support you? How could the audience support you now? What is their role? Go for it, Victoria. <laughs> I feel like we all have a job in this, in, in what we're trying to accomplish. We all, like I said before, we all have to do our research. We all have to do our reading. We have to do our listening. Mm. We have to do our, our discussions. We, we have to do all of these things to ensure that people are constantly thinking about these things because this is going this is an ongoing an, an ongoing matter that we have to address until the day that we die you know and 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 hopefully by that time we're better you know but until then we need to keep fighting we need to keep pushing we need to constantly be anti racist anti that is an active an active thing to do. It is not something that, as Quo said before, I've done my deed for the day. I'm going to put it on the back burner. I'm going to have a glass of wine and go on the next day and do what I need to do. It is a constant, constant, constant questioning of the system that you live in. And I think even as audience members, they can do their homework when they're sitting in an opera house, when they're interacting with patrons, when they're interacting with ushers, when they go out on their, you know, when they go day to day, if they have children, educate your children, El educate your, ch your children children's friends, educate your children's parents, uh, your, your children's friends' parents, educate as much as you can. Continue to, to lend and give resources so that other people can take those tools and do what they need to do to, to dismantle the system that we are currently living in. I'm constantly having discussions with um, um, white friends of mine, and we're always talking about these things. And I feel like it is wonderful that we are now being unapologetic with these conversations because they need to be had. And I know that my one friend is taking it to her son when she gets home and she's talking to him. He is six years old, but best believe that she will continue to talk to him until he understands that he has to also do this so that when he gets older, he will continue to pass this down to his friends and his family. Because we can't, we have to do this. If we don't do this and there's no way of any of this ever being I eradicated. I just, it, we just need to keep talking to each other. I just, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So I have a follow-up question uh, real quick. Is the book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi, is that a good resource to start with? Chip, what do you think? It's a good book. There are many good books, and there uh, I'm actually putting together a, a preferred reading list for for our company and for our greater family. And I think there's so many resources out there. You know, it, the, the door to understand equity is not doesn't just show up one way. There are many paths to justice, and some people need to read more. Some people need to talk more. Some people need to read uh, this one book, and some people need to read another. And your job is to find out, find the tool that helps to bring you the information that will help, uh, uh, you know, uh, fuel your transformation. Um, you know, as we're sitting here talking, and as I was just hearing Victoria talk about, uh, kind of respond to, to Carlos's last question, and I love the critical thinking that, that this individual is doing. Um, we're leaning towards justice. If we get into the existential part of this, we're all, you know, we're here because we're, we're in community with one another and the universe is leaning towards justice. So where are you in that paradox? 
You have to ask audiences, music makers, creators, funders, we all have to ask, where are you in this paradigm? And there's so many different places and stages where you can disrupt where you can interrupt injustice. Maybe if you maybe you're sponsoring a, a school program so children who've never had access to music education get it. Maybe you are funding a fellowship to an organization that gives a, a pre-performance, uh, an artist, a young and upcoming black artist, a chance to get the training and the private instruction they need. Or maybe you are giving a little extra money to the education, outreach, and community engagement department so they can do their work. I don't know. There are many ways to interrupt injustice. Find your path. And it has to be with, and, and it's not all money. It's about also activity. It's about it's about lending your, your time, your voice, your resources in all the ways. But I like this idea of, of, of what Victoria is really saying. She's like, educate yourself. You have one job. You have one job, especially if you have unearned privilege. You have one job, and that is to notice it. Thank you, Chip. I think we have a few more questions. Um, and I know we are 15 minutes past the program, uh, but we we are gonna take one more question. Uh, so if, the, let's see. And if I may, I'd like to, as you're looking for that question, um, just to add on, because Carlos asked how audiences can support us now, I encourage everyone to embrace your humanity. Embrace the beautiful things about you, embrace the ways in which you have everything you need to truly connect to others. Center that. Center that and how you're doing your work. Center connection, center truth above everything else, above your own comfort, above mm -hmm. the ways in which you believe your lived experiences are more important than mm -hmm. others because they're not. You want to know what to read, read your history. It's all there. So much of it has been covered up, it's all there. So start to learn. Start to find your own paths and how people have lived and how these experiences have taken place and hold space for others because others will hold space for you. And don't get weary, right? <laughs> in this, in this, this is this is a long game. This is lifelong. So do not expect those changes or those spaces to come immediately, but know that the moment you have experienced them, the moment that you create them, they are contagious. So just take heart in that. Cause you can do it. We can all do it. We're doing it. We can all do it. Thank you, Quo. I have a question for Chip. Uh, how can opera companies change for equity and social justice in their fundraising practices? Ooh, oh my gosh. <laughs> you have hit on something else I have very strong feelings about. Wait, is there anything I don't have strong feelings about? I don't know. Um, here's, the deal. here's the deal. You know, Quo, Quo has mentioned it before and I think we need to really take time to, to understand this this ways in which we bifurcate things, the ways in which we create either ors, the ways in which we create unfair competition between large and small organizations, between classical arts and folk arts. All of this is partly perpetuated by our funders. They can do a better job of not pitting one group against another, of not creating an either or situation. I think the idea of, of um, the ways in which, what has come up recently, the ways in which they ask for documentation and information and evidence is antiquated. You really want me to sit and write you two paragraphs about how I changed someone's life? If there's more than that, I can tell that story in a, in a two minute video. Like it, it, there, there's so many different ways of reporting and of demonstrating process, product, uh, 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 impact. And so this, the ways in which we're held in a very small context and how we report these things are oppressive. And of course the instruments themselves, the applications themselves are, are, can actually be insurmountable for too many people and they create a barrier to access. So I, I think there, I've just given you three strategies. One, stop dividing our field. B, uh, come up with, with ways of, of us telling you our stories of our success that are not in this, not only binary, but in this limited uh, capacity and, and find ways of, of, of finding a space. How about if you have some money set aside that's unnamed? You know, stop saying, oh, this is the money for the X, this is money for Y. What if you have some money called, people come up with a great idea and I want to fund it? I want that, I want that pile of money. Love that. Thank you, Chip. And I think with that, we have come to the end of our program. And I just want to thank you, uh, Quo, Chip, Victoria, uh, for your time this evening. You have been terrific 
I really appreciated hearing from you, each and every one of you. Uh, you have helped us gain clarity around very important topics. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of the program. I also want to thank everyone at home who joined us and watched, and, and especially to the ones who asked some really thoughtful questions. It was wonderful to spend this evening with all of you. Um, again, to the audience, if you have enjoyed the program, we would like for you to consider making a donation. So programs like these are possible. Uh, with the Cincinnati Opera. Also, if you want to receive information about our upcoming Center Stage program, please feel free to send us an email to centerstage at cincinnatiopera.org. Um, we will leave the email address in the chat or consider following us on our Facebook and our Instagram. And with that, I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for participating tonight. Thank you and good night.